Mr. Chairman, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> In my presentation today, I will focus on an aspect of Chinese-Pakistan cooperation. And uh, as it is also concerning security within the Indian Ocean, I will talk a little bit on China's so-called string of pearls policy. And the aspect of terrorism will be included in this presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, during my years in Islamabad in the 1990s, I had the opportunity to accompany the former Pakistani army chief, General Mirza Aslam Beck, on three different trips to China. The Chinese don't forget old friends and invited Beck also after his active service. One point which surprised me during these trips was that one could find in the libraries of think tanks and universities visited by us a 300, no, 230 page study titled The Eurasian Land Bridge, a new Silk Road as Motor for Economic Development. This 230 page study was, to my big surprise, published in Germany in 1996 by a small German political activist group based in Wiesbaden near Frankfurt. Head of this group was, and the elder ones amongst you might probably still know his name, Lyndon LaRouche, a US citizen and political activist who was living in Germany and married to a German political activist by the name of Helga Sepp LaRouche. According to the monthly magazine of this group, this couple had visited China quite often and was received by high-ranking Chinese officials. Why I do, do I mention this group? I don't know whether they still exist. This now 17 years old new Silk Road study from Wiesbaden, and it was of this format, came into my mind again when China's development plans became unfiled in autumn 2013, subdivided in Silk Road Economic Belt and 21st Century Maritime Silk Road, both today known as One Belt, One Road strategy. It proved, at least to me, that China's geostrategist had worked for years over a strategy which China's paramount leader Xi Jinping and his Premier Minister Li Keqiang are now promoting during their state visits in Asia and in Europe. During his visit to Pakistan in April 2015, President Xi Jinping signed agreements with Pakistan over development projects worth 20, uh, 46 billion US dollars, a spending which is focusing on building a 3,000 kilometer or 1,800 miles China-Pakistan economic corridor. This corridor will connect Pakistan's deep seaport Kuala, located at the Arabian Sea, to China's western Xinjiang region. International analysts see this China-Pakistan economic corridor as President Jinping's biggest gambit in the One Belt, One Road strategy. Since signing these agreements in April 2015, the vast majority of Pakistan's politicians, economics and strategists believe that CPEC and in particular, the development of Gwada will bring Pakistan wealth, prosperity, regional importance, and recognition. But it speaks for good political reporting in Pakistan that also in 2015, some writers pointed towards soft points within the whole corridor project. For example, in September 2015, the paper, the Express Tribune, published an opinion from a Pakistani analyst under the headline, Gwada String of Perils. In this article, the writer said, and now I quote, 
what we should be considering through is that while China has built some roads in Pakistan, it still needs to lay thousands of kilometers of gas and oil pipelines and railway tracks in order to put Gwada into use. That will cost money and China may be reluctant to invest if the region continues to be volatile. Furthermore, Pakistan faces a law called insurgency in Balochistan, where Gwada is located and through which the proposed pipelines will pass." Unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, in my mind, it speaks for the quality of this writing when the guilt for the situation in the province of Balochistan is not seen coming only from outside Pakistan. Alvi, Raita, uh, Alvi Sata, the writer, writes again, quote, several tribal chiefs and are opposing a large-scale foreign investment, fearing it will bring an influx of outsiders. The demand, they demand greater autonomy and royalties for the extraction of natural resources. Although China has developed local infrastructure, it is considering as an it is considered as an exploiter by some segments of the local uh, population." Unquote. Pakistan security strategists see the situation, of course, in a different way. In a paper given to me in August 2015 by the ISI, they say, and I quote again, due to economic potentials, Balochistan has become a venue of geopolitics and battlefield of economic interests between global and regional power players. Balochistan was becoming prone to terrorism and sectarianism violence. However, these tendencies have been sufficiently contained. An analysis of summary of terrorism incidents occurred in Balochistan resulting in the killings of 2,407 civilian security forces and 5,229 injured. However, owing to affecting countermeasures and restricting the role of dubious international NGOs, the situation is improving." Unquote. Of course, ladies and gentlemen, this ISI paper points especially also to the research and analysis wing of India. For example, like this, and I quote last time, raw in collusion with other agencies, especially Afghan National Directorate of Security, is fomenting instability in Pakistan by providing financial support, training, weapons and explosives and sanctuaries on foreign soil. Indian embassies and consulates in Afghanistan are directly involved in funding, coordinating and supporting Balochistan sub-nationalists, miscreants, and Tariq Taliban Pakistan." Unquote. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have no difficulties to quote from this ISI paper in my presentation here in New Delhi, because it is widely known that the ISI works similar in Kashmir. It is simply the name of the game. And in my book about the ISI published in 2016, I have used clear words also about what happened in Mumbai in 2008. And I quote myself, an operation such as the Mumbai attacks, which needed expert technical assessment, money and time to prepare, could not have been carried out or kept hidden without the knowledge of the services leadership. Considering the political explosiveness of the event, the cores as well would have, have been informed." Unquote. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have in mind to go to Pakistan again next month. Uh, it is also clearly that Lashkar Taiba use of maritime approach on its way to Mumbai in 2008 was already a terrorist act of the same quality like the attacks on USS Cole in 2000 and the French tanker Limburg in 2002. A precondition uh, for a way out of this situation, in my mind, will only be inside if Islamabad and Rawalpindi are putting their present Kashmir policy 
for a longer time on ice. China's leadership has recommended this way to Pakistan more than 20 years ago, and it might do so again, at least that's what I hope. If Pakistan will follow such an advice, terrorism in South Asia and parts of the Indian Ocean might drop significantly. Now back to Gwada and the question whether at the end of the Chinese-Pakistan economic corridor, Port Guava will be a success, question mark. As said before, most Pakistanis are heavy optimistic about it. Pessimism one could find only in some articles, for example, uh, in the article of strategic interest in Pakistan ports at Guada, and also in Guada's string of perils, and lately in February by James Dorsey who wrote the article ASEAN ports, pitfalls of China's One Belt, One Road initiative, in which he claimed that the China-Pakistan economic corridor might not be successful at the end. I don't agree with him. I think China's paramount leader, Xi Jinping, will not end his approximately 10 years term around 2023 with a failure of the corridor project. Far too much money and prestige are already invested. And Beijing's development policy in Western China, even if China's economic growth rate might be lower in future, demands access to the Indian Ocean. China is investing around 51 billion in Pakistan infrastructure and energy, including Port Gwada. Beijing has also deployed 15,000 soldiers to protect Chinese workers in Pakistan. And Pakistan itself has built up a 17,000 man special force to protect its own interest in the China-Pakistan economic corridor. It is therefore all set to keep the so-called low-scale insurgency in Balochistan under control. And if that is the case, thinking about the shortest link from Guada to Central Asia via Afghanistan might be realistic again. Pakistan's political and military leadership have started a new initiative to come to an understanding with Kabul and with major groups of the Afghan Taliban. Whether it will be successful in the near future remains to be seen, as ISIL, or DASH as it is called here, at latest incidents have proved, has also now a foothold in Afghanistan. And uh, something else came to my mind yesterday. The Honorable Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, of Afghanistan was here. And in his presentation, he pointed out there are no good terrorists, there are no bad terrorists, there are only terrorists. But one could read just recently that the government in Kabul has called back Hek Madhya, uh, has hacked him, and he is now a part of the business again. Now, if he doesn't, uh, be, doesn't was a pair terrorist, I don't understand the world anymore. Now, uh, the, the, the deputy minister might have pointed to real politics, but if real politics matters so much, then of course the old sentence that my enemy's enemy is my friend is, guilt, is, is, is still existing, and that was refused in a few presentations yesterday. The Pakistani side will give their utmost to fulfill all financial burdens of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. The total commitment amount, it are 50 billions and is divided into two broad categories. 35 billion allocated for energy products and 15 billions for infrastructure. Whether Pakistan will be able to bring up such money, it's debatable. I have my doubts again. Back to the one belt, one road, and other possibility pitfalls, there is a present a fragile political situation in Sri Lanka, where China has developed port uh, Hamba Tota, it is seen by analysts as another question mark whether Chinese ring of birds within that. They point towards Sri Lanka's former president who has warned China in December 2016 
that public protest would erupt if plans proceeded to build in Humber Tota a 6,000 hectare economic zone that will buffet a 1.5 deep, deep, uh, billion deep seaport, a 20, uh, 2000, 209 million international airport, and a world class cricket stadium, a Robinson Center, and new roads. But if political turmoils in Sri Lanka might keep Chinese investors being more careful in spending over there, Beijing still has more options in its string of pearl scenario. There are the container ports facilities built by China in Chittagong, Bangladesh, and roads, dams, and pipelines built in Myanmar. A group of uh, Chinese uh, investors, Chinese group corporation, has won two contracts related to a special economic zone in Western Myanmar and so forth. But of course, ladies and gentlemen, but each story has two sides. Over the last three years, there were also disputes between both Beijing and Rangoon for different reasons, most about royalties, prices, and compensations. These problems are not solved yet, and contracts might have to be renegotiated. International political observers see Myanmar again as a failure in China's string of pearls. In my mind, this is unlikely. Both sides will come to an understanding. China needs a short links to southern China via Myanmar and the Bonese government, the investment and the money from the big neighbor. There's at the end the question whether China plans to use Gwada for a naval purpose. The Pakistani Ali Sata wrote in September 2015, Despite over a decade having passed since China started constructing the first phase of Gaza, no military-related activity has ever been observed there. Its current interest appears to be commercial, aiming at securing an alternative route for its energy supply." Unquote. Indeed, as far as the naval interests are concerned, China concentrated so far on the South China Sea. But that might change. Analysts are predicting that after a decade, China might have more warships than in the USA. I think in November 2016, <coughs> there were uh, Pakistani media full with reports about an Indian submarine trying to enter Pakistani territorial waters, aiming to reach Port Gwada for spying. According to a spokesman of Pakistan Navy, the submarine was detected through aerial survivals, was continuously tracked by Navy fleet units and pushed out of Pakistani waters. A spokesman of Indian Navy, of course, denied that it all has ever occurred. But interestingly, the whole story came up just a couple of days before Pakistan and China started naval exercise in the Arabian Sea. As a reaction to the whole incident, China handed over two Navy ships to Pakistan in January this year for joint security along the sea route of the China-Pakistan economic belt. China also promised to deliver two more state of the RC ships to Pakistan in the future. Iran, which was watching the whole situation over the last years, for example, seems to have taken all this account into account already and in February 2013, it was already announced that a new naval base would be built in Pasabanda, Makran, near Iran's border to Pakistan. Iran's navy began to intensify its efforts to develop the Makran coast, stretching from Banda Abbas to Pasabanda. I think that the Iranians expect Chinese naval ships in the near future also in Gwada, and I think they are right. Thank you.